Here's a quick demo of the PLS POS segmentation feature in PLS GUI. So let, let's start up PLS GUI. So here's PLS GUI and you, you notice that there's a button segmentation PLS POS. This is a technique for finding so-called latent heterogeneity in your data set. Uh, you're, if you have a data set, let's say a thousand observations, and you fit a PLS path model, let's do that. We'll load in uh, both a, we'll choose a, uh, a pretty large data set, TAM data set, with uh, 1,200 observations, and we'll make sure we have the right model for that one. It's this one here. And we can run, let's just run PLS quickly. So I say linear PLS, this just runs a path model. So we have something to look at. Here's the, this is the inner model. And these are regressions. Um, attitude is being predicted by perceived usefulness and by perceived ease of use. Use is being predicted by attitude and by behavioral intention. Whenever you have a regression, you have both a predicted level of the dependent variable and you have an observed level of the dependent variable. So that's true for any dependent variable or endogenous variable, as they're called in latent models, latent variable models. Any, uh, any uh, latent variable that is predicted is endogenous. So you will have residuals. Uh, that's what PLS POS works with. It starts with your entire data set, then it arbitrarily, randomly uh, assigns the observations to either two or three levels. Let's do that. So we push the button. We can go for two levels or three levels. We'll say three. How many times do you want it to run? Well, uh, we, won't, we don't have to go that many. We'll just say 199 times. And when we push the button, what it does is it looks at the residuals. You can see it running back here. It looks at the residuals for the endogenous variables in each of the three groups that were arbitrarily created. And it reassigns observations from one group to another in such a way as to make the residuals homogeneous and maximize the R-squared value. You can see the R-squared value going up, up, up. This is the cumulative R-squared for all three groups. Okay, so that's basically what it's doing. You have, you have three models running, and it runs the model, looks at all the residuals, finds the observation with the largest residual, and puts it in another group where it's more homogeneous. Okay, so it went all the way through, and um, then... It outputs the data set where the R-squared was maximized, which in this case appears to be the very last one, puts it all back into one data set, but appends a column. Let me show you. It, it took the results, put it in our files directory. The files directory is the one that you set over here in the directories button. You set the main directory, the files directory. This is where special outputted files end up. This is one of those files. This is the output from the segmentation routine. It took the observations in the three groups and put it back into one file so that you can then check the differences for all of the estimated parameters in the three groups. So let's load up that file. So we will we'll say, um, f uh, we'll, we'll open up the output from the PLS segmentation and it's where the R squared was maximized there we go so we open it up and we can view it let's view the data set so now it's the active data set and here it is it's the original data set but it's appended this column at the end that is the group and this data set has 1200 observations it's pretty large Note, these are the original row numbers in the order that they were in before. 
Okay, but now we have three different groups. So here's group one, and that goes down to record number um, it goes down to record number I went by it already. This one, 250. So there's 250 in the first group. Then group two starts up. And that goes down to record, uh, it's a pretty large group, stops right about uh, here, record 655. And then the rest are all in group three. Okay, so this is the data set. The three groups have been merged back into one file at the point at which the R squared was maximized. Okay, well, what does that get us? Each of those groups are going to be more homogeneous. What does that mean? Okay, so let's let's check. We'll run we'll run uh, my my MGA function. Okay, and so uh, it finds variables that are appropriate for grouping, and there's only one. And we'll just say we'll say what? Uh, no, we don't need that many. We'll go for 193. And what this routine does it automatically computes a three-way MGA, multi multiple group analysis. So let's, let's do it. So what we're doing is we're taking the output from PLS POS, and now we're running it through the MGA to see if there are actually differences in those three groups based on uh, the estimated parameters. That's the purpose of PLS POS, is to find undiscovered groups in your data based on the errors in such a way to maximize the R squared value. And again, you, I refer you to that MISQ 2013 Becker article entitled um, Discovering Unobserved Heterogeneity in Structural Equation Models to Avert Validity Threats. Okay, so the MGA completed, so let's look at the results of the MGA. Okay, so here we go. You'll note that it's finding significant differences. These are the paths. These are the paths between groups one and two. Look at how many of the, there are only seven direct paths in our model, and five of them are significantly different from, from between groups one and two. Six of them are significantly different between groups one and three, and five of them are significantly different between groups two and three. Not only that, but the MGA program checks for differences in loadings, so we can look at the loadings. The loadings are pretty, are pretty consistent between 1 and 2. Uh, some differences, 1 and 3. Some differences, 2 and 3. It also checks the weights. Okay, but this is what's really more interesting. Uh, you will find differences in some of the weights. The latent variables are generally the same in all groups, and that's what you want. You want the latent variable values not to be significantly different. And generally they are with this PLS pause. Why is that important? Because if you have significantly different mean scores in the latent variables, it means they don't represent the same thing in the groups. But here they do, and that's typically true. Um, you also have, it checks the differences in the direct and indirect effects. But here's the last thing that's really interesting. Let's go to the R squared values and check them between groups. You, you generally will find significant differences. The R squares, these are only for the predicted variables, of course. But between 1 and 2, uh, attitude and use have very different R squares. Here's the global R squared for attitude, about 20%. Here's the R squared in the first group, 81%. Here's the R squared in the second group, 31%. Both are much, much, much higher than the global estimate. We were only predicting 20% of the variance in attitude. Let's, let's look at use. If you go back to, my, to the original path model, use is the ultimate predicted variable in this model. That's really what we're trying to predict. So let's go see how much of the variance of use we predicted in the original model. And it's this much. We predicted only 11.5% of the variance in use. 
after it ran it through the segmentation routine, in group one, it predicted 45%. Group two, only 9%. But they are significant differences, and that's what you're looking for. Also, you, you know, this, this model, group one, is a much better predictor. All of the R-squareds are very high compared to the global model. I mean, dramatically so, two and three times as much. Now, th this is completely unrehearsed, and this was just a random case. But let's go, let's go over here to the uh, groups one and three. Uh, again, uh, well, you can see what's happened. Three is a little lower. You can see what's happened. Group one, the model, has, is unchanged. But for the observations in group one, for some reason, because they are homogenous, that's the reason. The, per, the reason for the hom homogeneity is something you have to investigate. Have very high R-squared values. So you find big differences between the groups in R-squared. And you should because it is maximizing them, which means one or two groups will be very high and the other ones will not. So here's our, our second group estimate versus the third. The third group had pretty low R-squareds compared to the global. Second group, again, much higher, almost twice as high as the global R-squareds. So if you looked at the observations in the second group, and if you looked at the observations in the first group, the model is predicting much, much better. It, it's, it's a better predictor. Why, well, why is that? Well, then you have to go, you, have, you, have, you know which observations are in the groups. Okay, so you then you can proceed to investigate why. But uh, just to recap briefly, the contribution of this approach, it's a cluster analysis approach. It finds latent groupings that are significant. That's the same thing you do with this, with MGA, when you, for example, you have, you've collected a large set of data and you have data from country a, country B, and country C, and you want to know the differences in the path coefficients between country A, B, and C. You run an MGA based on those three groups, but you know the group differences beforehand. PLS-POS is a, a way to find groups that you did not know about, and it's, it's a superior technique to FIMIX PLS Fimix PLS is based on maximum likelihood, and it's just not a good fit with uh, PLS path modeling. This is a very ef effective technique, which, which will automatically find your groups and maximize the R-squareds overall and minimize the residuals overall in the process, which is, which is what PLS path modeling is all about.